So our special guest today is Ben Farthing. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started writing? Yeah, um, I've been writing since I was a teenager. Um, the first story I remember getting kind of praise for was in ninth or 10th grade and I entered a countywide public school writing contest and I don't remember if I won or got second or third place but I remember my English teacher being very excited about it um, and then I just kept writing always writing I studied English and creative writing my undergrad and took a f after that worked in marketing for a few years and did an MFA um, while working freelance marketing. Yeah. And all that time going to cons and workshops and writing stories and submitting them and writing novels and sitting on them. And then a few years ago, one of my friends suggested that I start publishing my novels. And now I'm here. So are you self-publishing? Yes. Yeah, all my novels yeah. are self-published. Fantastic. And obviously you've got the marketing behind it as well. I'm assuming that comes in quite handy. Yeah, definitely. It's, um, you know, and not just with the marketing angle of it, but with the, the writing itself, um, with the type of marketing I do, it's very emotional. And so it's helped me when I'm writing novels to really focus on the kind of emotional journey that I want to take the reader on. Yeah. So what made you pick horror? Well, <laughs> so I, my first novel I wrote was actually high fantasy. And then the second novel I wrote was sort of urban fantasy crossed with horror. And then I wrote a thriller. Um, and then when I decided to start self-publishing, I joined a couple of, I joined a bunch of Facebook groups for horror books and a bunch of Facebook groups for urban fantasy books because I liked that too at the time. And as yeah. I would scroll Facebook, I'd say, why is all this urban fantasy clogging up my feed? I just want to read about horror. And I, at some point, urban fantasy, I got bored of it, but I think horror has always been my first love. And um, ever since I was watching creepy movies as a kid, reading Goosebumps and creepy kids books. Yeah, I mean, most kids, most kids books these days are creepy. I, I can't remember what they was like back then. It's been a long time. Um, I do remember Goosebump, uh, Goosebumps. Uh, I like the, I like the movies as well. Yeah, I'm not. I definitely watched the show as a kid. And then, yeah, the movies were fun. I haven't checked out. There's like a new series, Goosebumps series on Disney+. Plus. I haven't turned it on yet. No, nor me. I think, I think the most I've watched on Disney Plus recently is the new Haunted House. Yeah, me and my wife watched that. It was, I enjoyed it. <laughs> it was amazing, yeah. but I enjoyed it. I like it was those actors are fun to watch. So yeah. <laughs> even if it wasn't great, it was fun to watch. So here's probably a popular question. Where do you where do your ideas come from? Oh. Well, the fun answer is that a lot of my ideas come from images from nightmares. Um, and it's recently, that's definitely been the case. Um, actually, I started taking a medicine that makes my dreams more vivid. Well, that's a side effect. It's not like a <laughs> on purpose thing. Um, <laughs> and so when I do have nightmares which is, I, from what I understand, much more frequently than the average adult, um, I will retain some of those freaky images. I write in the afterword of my most recent novella, I found puppets living in my apartment walls. Um, I share the story in the afterword, but I always had nightmares about specifically like Jim Henson Muppets, like the big furry, big wide-eyed things with the giant mouths. Um, yeah. And definitely a lot as a kid. And then even as an adult, they would pop up when I'd be stressed out in life or just whenever. And I had 
finished working on or had published a novella and was writing a haunted house book. And then I had this nightmare about a uh, Muppet standing in my bedroom closet and looking at me while I was in bed. And I woke up the next morning. And I was like, nope, I'm going to set aside this haunted house book and I'm going to write. I'm going to write a book about scary puppets. Yeah, I can see I can see why you do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so a lot of my ideas do come from. Well, they'll start with an image from a nightmare. And then I've also I also read once I forget who said it, some writing coach, I believe it was a horror author giving advice, said to um, halfway through a book, think about how you think it'll end. And then when it doesn't end that way, then you've got a story idea you can write. Just fill in the first half. Yeah. And so I do kind of get, I get a lot of ideas while reading other people's work or watching movies and not just the ones that I'm, you know, blatantly rip off, but like um, just ideas that, that spark from watching something where you're guessing how something's going to turn out and then it turns out differently and you're like, oh, well, that was a good idea. I'm going to use that. Yeah. It's a good way. I mean, I know you said you're basically ripping it off, but it's like um, we've said before in many interviews that every author has a unique take on a particular story. That's probably why there are so many haunted houses, uh, vampires and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Um I mean, some of that is people like reading the same story over and over again. And some of it is, yeah, sometimes an author will just take a classic idea and make it entirely new or make it feel entirely new, which is always really fun to read. So how do you like building your characters? I've done it a lot of different ways. Um, usually so what interests me about horror is usually the really strange supernatural ideas so like in my recent works it's um it's children's show puppets living in the walls or it's a circus tent that's appeared out of nowhere or it's a library that's grown a new wing you know so this is like what attracts me to horror what, what makes me pick up a book or a movie yeah. So that's where I'll start. So I'm throwing my cat around, jumping on the computer. And so I'll start with that like really strange idea that I want to explore and write about characters who are exploring it. But then I want, like I, I said earlier, like I want to take the reader on an emotional journey. And that's only going to happen if there's a character who or relating to who they start to kind of live through in this story. Yeah. And so I'll get a general idea of the horror element that they're going to confront and then work backwards from there with, you know, who is the absolute worst person to be forced to confront this? You know, what about them makes, makes this is going to make this so much more difficult for them. So in my, in my puppet book was, we have this premise of the puppets from a canceled television show are in living in the inside and beneath this apartment building. So working backwards from there, I made the main character, a grandson of one of the puppeteers and then in actually building this character it became important that he was dealing very poorly with leaving his childhood behind um, yeah. and wanted to go back even though his childhood was very um, not healthy emotionally and so that's how that character came to be and of course a lot of it you know is going to come from me i've written you know, entire books, or actually a play is what comes to mind. I wrote once in college where every single character was just some exaggerated desire or emotion that I had, you know, from the heroes to the supporting characters to the villains. It was all, 
I know what this feels like. like this is going to be this person's driving desire and emotion, and I know what that feels like. So what would that feel like times 10? Let me play that up and make that this character's main main thing. So it's, you know, what, what fits the story? What's going to, who's going to be the absolute, who's going to have the absolute hardest time facing this horror and then blend it with usually aspects of my own personality so that I can more realistically create that person. So if you got, is there any sort of like themes that you often explore in your writing? Um, sometimes I will kind of purposely explore a theme. My novel, The Piper's Graveyard, the themes are pretty heavy handed about um, kind of cultural and social propaganda. But then the themes I find myself often coming back to are ideas of like characters dealing with guilt and regret. Um, and then a lot of like characters trying to understand, I'm trying to figure out how to say this, like not quite their place in the world, but yeah. how to make sense of their world even before the supernatural horror start. Do you feel that sort of like um, runs off experience, experiences or fears of your own? Yeah, 100%. Um, I mean, you can read my books in, like, in order of release date and just sort of see what I was stressed out and worried about at the time. Like my novel, um, Those Who Dwell Below the Sidewalk, the main character is living off grid, but like in the city. So living, you know, under a false identity and running his own cash business and trying to avoid being forced into one of these cults that he finds. And at the time I was 25 or something and trying to avoid working, trying to avoid a nine to five job and starting a freelance career and feeling a lot of pressure to, to do the normal cubicle thing. And yeah. you know, that's what I wrote about. Or my no my novella, I found a circus tent that was behind my house is very much about figuring out whether I can still be like helpful in the world around me if I can go out and serve people, if I can go out and volunteer when my children are, are little. And they need my time, and I'm committed to that. And that's the most important thing is my is my young children. And that's um, so you can read all about that fear in, in mm -hmm. Circus Tent. And then the most recent one is about you know me grappling with my own grief for my grandfather who passed away a few years ago, and that connecting to nostalgia for childhood. So yeah, it very much is is my own of what yeah. I'm wrestling with mentally and emotionally that I usually, I often put into my books, not all of them, but. So yeah, I've spoken to, um, speaking to authors, they've said the, the same thing that they do sort of like put their own experiences and their own um, traumas that they're going through day to day life. And they find it kind of a therapy. Did, did you find that? It can be. Um, I'm often, I mean, it's a therapy in, in that saying something out loud is a therapy. I don't often have answers in my books for these sorts of things. I just put them onto the page. Um, but yeah, in, in some way it's a therapy. It's nice when I, I hear from a reader, like with the puppets book, I heard from a couple of readers that it, it helped them kind of confront their own grief or it helped them kind of settle into how they want to remember their childhood. Yeah. And so it's, it's really nice to hear that like, Oh, it was a therapy for somebody else and not just telling scary stories. It's actually helping somebody. It's pretty, it's really cool to hear. Yeah. A few, a few authors have said the same thing, um, that it's kind of like a therapy. So yeah, 
I suppose it's one way that they can deal with their traumas by just putting it on paper and hopefully forgetting the traumas. So, um, yeah. So are you a plotter or a pantser? Oh, I'll tell you something different every time you ask me. Um, <laughs> every book's been different. I what I'm growing most comfortable with is figuring out the ending, both in terms of the plot and especially like the emotional climax for the main character. And then once I know that, I need to make sure if there is some sort of bad guy plot, you know, if, if it's a supernatural villain who's driving everything, I need to make sure I understand what its plan is, what its goal is, what it's going to be yeah. doing along the way. And then once I have all that down, I like to pants. I like to just write. I get in the main character's head and follow them to the goal to the end point that I know is coming. If I don't know the end in advance, I wander a lot and I rewrite a lot. And that's actually where I am right now in my current novella. I'm, I don't know, on draft four or something of, because I knew the emotional end to what I wanted, but I didn't actually have the plot nailed down at the end. And so I've been redoing it and changing one thing, changing something else, and then I write again. And yeah. Yeah. so I like to pants towards the end. And so you find that's best. Obviously, you find that's better if you do it that way. Um, I don't. Yeah. It's it's weird um, for me to sort of like explain this, but I've never been able to sort of see the end of the. The book, I kind of get there, sort of like between pantsing and plotting. So it's intriguing how you can see the end and then kind of work your way backwards. Yeah, I'll, often I'll write the end first. I write like an opening scene and then I'll write the emotional climax and then I'll go back and write the rest. I think it's, I think it's amazing how you can do it that way, I'll be honest. Yeah, well, I've, I've done it lots of different ways, but that's what I've been doing most recently. And that's I've, the I've best spent, way for you? Yeah, especially with novellas, where it's... I've usually outlined when it comes to longer novels, because it's, it's easier to keep things kind of together. But with novellas, where it's 20,000, 30,000 words, and it, you know, it all happens in an evening... Um, I'm not as worried about keeping all the balls in the air. I'm confident I can do that, and that yeah. that lets me. Yeah, well, you're you're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I mean, <laughs> being able to outline, or I do feel I, I'm almost jealous sometimes of people, or like Stephen King, or lots of people who say they just start writing and they explore until the end, and I'm like, that sounds fun. <laughs> But if it, if it could work, but for me, it's, it's, I just, I can't quiet my mind. I just, yeah. every, every sentence I'm thinking of a million possibilities and I need a goalpost that I'm aiming towards. Yeah. I'd, I'd be going off at different tangents. I'd be honest if I didn't plot so much. Um, but yeah, I'd kind of like start off plotting and then go on a pants earth rage and then have to go back over it all again yeah i've been there you okay. redo the outline <laughs> that's it so are there any exciting products that you're currently working on that you can share with us yeah um so i'm turning this series or these two novellas obviously into a series um, called i found horror and they'll they'll each stand alone and they'll each kind of maintain this surreal creepiness. And I really like this idea of things that should almost be funny. But then when you read it, it's only, it's only terrifying. Um, yeah. So I have 
I found a circus tent in the woods behind my house. I have, I found puppets living in my apartment walls. And right now I'm hopefully going to have done before Christmas, a book called, I found Christmas lights crawling from a storm drain, which started out as a loose retelling of HP Lovecraft's the color out of space and sort of evolved into its own thing. Um, but it's a, uh, about I'm a kid in a damaged family in a suburban neighborhood in the mid nineties during a tacky lights contest. So, you know, bright Christmas lights all up and down this street. Yeah. And while he's working with his friends to decorate an unfinished house so that he can show it to his parents and get them excited about Christmas again, while he's doing that, he sees a glow coming from the storm drain and finds Christmas lights, strings of Christmas lights crawling uphill in the drains. And then as they try to use those lights to decorate and then investigate the weirdness, they slowly realize something very strange and foreign is happening to their neighborhood. So it's a story about Christmas in the 90s. It's a story about a kid who needs, about a kid who wants to figure out how to tell his parents that he exists. Um, and it's a story about classic Christmas itch turning horrifically dangerous. And I'm really excited about it. It sounds intriguing. Yeah, thank you. I love Christmas as much as I love horror, so I'm having a whole lot of fun <laughs> with it. So do you decorate the house I outside? Do. I do, inside and out. Um, outside, we've got a little bit of grass and then a patch of woods before the street. And so I decorate that patch of woods to be a candy cane forest. Lots of red and white lights up the trees. And then my wife and I have made um, giant lollipops and things like that. So that's a lot of fun. How long does it take you to do all that? Well, so this will be the second year we're doing it. Um, it took, oh, I don't know six or eight hours total to set up stuff. I mean, once everything was made to set it up, this year will probably take a lot more because I'm going <laughs> to cover a lot more trees and lights. I'll get started pretty soon here, actually. And do you do the same thing for Halloween? We haven't yet. We do have a little, a few lights out there, but nothing too crazy yet. Um, my wife has told me she wants to do it. So in the next few years, we might have a haunted forest in front of the house. <laughs> we don't do it so much over here. I know it's um, I know it's starting to catch. Uh, a lot more houses are getting decorated for Halloween. Um, but I know where over in the US it's quite popular, isn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, not as much so as Christmas lights. Yeah, Christmas lights. Not, I don't really see many houses anymore around here with Christmas lights. It must mm. just be this area. Still <laughs> <laughs> <Your> stooges. <laughs> okay, well, we've got so... a neighbor up the street who has been like on the you know tacky lights tour that gets posted on the local news websites so knowing that people are going to be driving by my house to go see his is a lot of motivation to say, oh i'm gonna set up something for people to see because they're going to be driving by anyway um, that's <laughs> you should fun. put an advertisement for your books outside as well yeah okay so where can listeners find your books um, all of my books are on Amazon, and almost all of them are on Audible. And then the two newest novellas 
are also everywhere. They're also on Apple Books and Kobo and Barnes and Noble, their ebook store. Also on godless.com. Both of those are on there. So brilliant. Well, thank you for your time, Ben. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Is there anything you. else you'd like to add? Um let's see. I've let me give a book recommendation. It's not mine. I've been reading Hollow by Mike Salt, which is in a series, but the series can be read in any order. And it's about um, some people who end up in a tunnel under their town, down through a hole inside that tunnel into a network of caves. And it's really freaky and really strange, which is like my favorite type of horror. So if you like, if you have read me and you like the sort of mazes that I usually have in my books and the strange investigative aspect that I like to include, then I think you'll also enjoy Hollow by Mike Salt. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for recommending that. He, We did have him on the show. Oh, yeah. Um, Great. We we week ago, I think it was. Okay. So I'm we sure he should, talked about uh, Hollow by Mike He Salt. did. He did. Um, it's, a, it's a brilliant book. Um, yeah. Highly recommend it to anybody as well. So I'll second that. Great. Right. 